and welcome back to PNP Kids. We are going to be reading the second portion, part two of the Life of St. John Chrysostom. And we will be picking up right at page 59. If you have bought the book from New Rome Press, the Friends of Christ, this is from the November Synaxarian. So, so lovely and it's so beautifully illustrated. And we're, we hope that you can also see all the other things that they have on their site. So many beautiful books written so well. But you know that St. John's Feast is November 13th. And so we're here at this time. We're going to be celebrating his feast very soon. And so listen carefully and get all settled so we can learn about the rest of the life of St. John Chrysostom. Chrysostom then realized that his disciple had seen a vision. While he had been absorbed in his writing, the saint was quite sure that no one had visited him during the previous few days. He asked Proclus, what did this man look like? Master, I have never seen him before, but if you were to ask me who he resembles, I would say he looks similar to the image of the Apostle Paul, as he depict, as depicted in the icon that always hangs in your office. The saint then understood that God had answered his prayer. He was now sure that his homilies on the epistles were visions. St. John Chrysostom decided to interpret each of the apostles' 14 epistles. Of course, the patriarch did not forget the nobleman. He intervened with the emperor and convinced him to return the man's property and to restore him to his precious previous position. This was not the first or the last time that the tender-hearted Patriarch John defended those who were scorned and treated unjustly. He even reprimanded the Empress Evdosia, who oppressed widows and orphans and plundered their property. There was one particular instance in which he felt compelled to speak very boldly against her. It was harvest time, and the Empress had gone out to in inspect the royal vineyards, Passing by a certain widow's field, which was not part of the royal vineyard, Evdosia saw a delicious-looking bunch of grapes, and she ate it. Tasting the fruit sweetness, she be became envious, and she wanted the fields for herself. Her attendants tried to explain that this was the widow's property and, and was not part of the imperial properties. The cruel empress replied, Even better! I can add this to our holdings and make it part of the royal estate. She then ordered her servants to force the widow to give up her fruitful vineyard in exchange for a pitiful, barren field. To make matters worse, the widow had needed that income from the, that prosperous vineyard to care for her children. The poor woman refused to accept the proposal exchange of fields, but the hard-hearted empress was insistent. She ordered the field to be taken by force, whether or not the widow was in agreement. Desperate, the poor widow turned to Patriarch John for help. And of course, St. John did not hesitate to send letters to the Empress on behalf of the widow and to advise her to return the field. However, Evdosia rejected the saint's counsel and warned him to stay out of imperial business. The Empress even threatened to take away this pitiful, barren field that she had given in exchange for the fruit, fruitful field, leaving the widow without anything at all. St. John Chrysostom decided to publicly defend the widow. He chastised the empress in one of his sermons. Even this did not convince Evdosia. The feast day of the exaltation of the Holy Cross, which is September 14th, was approaching. This day was continued and was and continues to be a great feast for Christians. In those days, the imperial family was always present in church. On that day, when the feast day arrived, St. John Chrysostom instructed the church's gatekeepers to close the doors and bar the unjust empress from even entering. That was very bold of St. John, wasn't it? Because he risked everything because the empress could order anything to happen to him, but he went ahead to defend the widow. This is exactly what happened. And when Evlosia arrived at the church, she found the doors closed to her. 
This infuriated the emperor. She began to scream and shout accusations at the patriarch. She had actually claimed that the patriarch was being malicious towards her. Standing outside the church, one of her attendants raised his hand to look to knock on the door and something miraculous occurred. His hand was immediately paralyzed. Evdosia was terrified. She did not try to enter the church again, but rather she returned to the palace. Later, her servant repented to St. John and asked for forgiveness. St. John forgave him and restored his hand through God's grace. Instead of repenting, the shameless empress became even angrier with St. John and wanted to harm him. She gathered some corrupt priests and bishops to spread slanderous lies and convince the emperor to send St. John into exile. She succeeded in this malicious plot. However, her fortune quickly shifted. The same day the saint was sent into exile, there was a massive earthquake. The emperor interpreted this as a sign from God and he began to regret his decision to banish St. John. Therefore, to avoid further disaster, the emperor recalled the saint and allowed him to be re to return to his position at, as patriarch. The only person that was not convinced by these miraculous events was Evdosia. She became obsessed with slandering St. John and relentlessly tried to send him into exile. The empress found her opportunity on Holy Saturday when, without regard to the holy season, or the sacred place, she sent soldiers into the church during the divine service to arrest the patriarch. The cohort arrested the respected humble bishop and led him away. He was banished to a small pagan village in Armenia. There in the midst of unbelievers, the saint performed amazing miracles. He taught this faith to the people and he baptized them as Christians. So it was that the unjustified exile became a way of God, for God's name to be glorified and for St. John Chrysostom's holy reputation to spread. When the vengeful empress discovered these things, she commanded that the saint be exiled to an even more remote location. Therefore, he was led towards an, an abandoned city on the eastern shore of the Black Sea. Evlosia gave her soldiers strict orders to torture the saint during the journey. And if they killed him en route, all the better. Obedient to the empress's orders, the soldiers showed the saint no mercy. They refused to give him food or water. They made him walk in the burning hot sun and rain without allowing him to even rest. They denied him every sort of comfort and made his trip absolutely unbearable. One night during the journey, this escort stopped for the soldiers and the horses to rest. Exhausted from walking, the saint quickly fell asleep. In his sleep, St. John saw the apostle Peter and Paul approaching. They said to him, Rejoice, Brother John. Know that your sufferings are nearly over. Soon you will be with us in the kingdom of heaven. When the saint awoke, he felt new strength in his very weary body, while a sense of pure joy overwhelmed his soul. In the morning, they continued that journey until they arrived in, to a, in a city called Comana. Even this was not isolated enough, so they traveled six more miles outside the city to the church of St. Vasiliskos. St. Vasiliskos was a former bishop of Comana who was martyred in 303 AD in Nicomedia. The soldiers sat outside, sat outside the church to rest and eat while St. John went inside to pray. Weary, he fell asleep and he had yet another vision. In this vision, Saint, the saint saw Vas Saint Vasiliskos, who was gr who greeted him and said, "Do not be afraid, John. Tomorrow we will find ourselves together in heaven." When a morning came, John asked the soldiers if they could remain at that place for one more day. However, they refused his request. The soldiers grabbed the saint and told him to keep walking. 
They walked all day, but the area was unfamiliar and difficult to navigate. At the end of the day, they found him, themselves back in the very same place where they had started that very morning, the Church of St. Vasiliskos. At, that, at this point, St. John felt extremely weak and, ex and realized that he was surely about to die. He summoned the two priest monks who were following and, they to and told them about the vision that St. Vasilisko had given, had appeared to him. He then put on his sacred vestments, received the holy gifts, crossed his hands and said this phrase that he has been known for repeating in, the situ in every situation in life. He said, Glory to God for all things. St. John Chrysostom surrendered his holy soul to God on September 14th, 407 AD. Do you want to say those words with me that St. John Chrysostom said? Let's say it together. Glory to God for all things. His holy relics were buried next to the church of St. Basiliscos and worked many miracles for the region's inhabitants. Evdosia did not escape punishment. Indeed, when the emperor learned about his wife's actions against the patriarch, he ordered for her to be punished. Some time later, she suffered a painful death. After she was buried, it is, was noted that her grave would shake, which was interpreted to be a sign of her wickedness. The grave did not even stop shaking until St. John's relics were returned to Constantinople. 33 years after St. John's death, Evdosia's son, whose name was Theodosius the Younger, was the emperor of Constantinople now, and St. Proclus, Chrysostom's disciple, was the patriarch. Proclus convened, convinced the emperor to bring the saint's holy relics back to Constantinople. When the men arrived, at his burial place, they found that the saint's body had become too heavy and could not even be moved. When informed about this, the emperor was convinced that due to the men's pride and lack of repentance, the saint would not permit being moved. So Theodosius wrote a letter in which he asked the saint for forgiveness, and he asked him to allow his relics to be returned to the capital city of Constantinople. Palace officials took the letter and approached the saint's tomb. When they opened it, there was a bright light and an indescribable smell and fragrance came emanated from the tomb. St. John's face was joyful and flushed as if he were alive. Furthermore, after they pressed the letters on St. John's chest, the, relics, the relic was able to be removed from the tomb quite easily. Therefore, with great reverence, they set out to return to Constantinople. Yet, the miracles did not end there. On the voyage back to Constantinople, the ship was sailing smoothly when all of a sudden, a great storm appeared and scattered all the other boats. Only the ship transporting the relic continued on its proper course until it stopped near the ferry field of the widow who had mistreated, who, who had been mistreated by the Empress. Remember the widow we talked about? It seems that St. John wanted to remind everyone of the great injustice the Empress had done to her. When the sea calmed and all the inhabitants of the capital led by the Emperor Theodosius himself ran out to greet their beloved hierarch, the Emperor covered the relic with a royal cloak as a sign of deep respect, and then asked St. John to stop the tremors that emanated from his mother's tomb, when the saint, which the saint did immediately. After this, they led the sacred relics of the saint to the church of the holy apostles. The emperor commanded that they stand, that they stand St. John's relics on the bishop's throne in order to correct the injustice that was done by his mother so many years ago. All the people shouted, retake your throne, holy one. 
and miraculously the saint lifted his right hand, just like a priest lifts, blesses you, okay? He lifted his right hand and he blessed the people and he exclaimed and exclaimed, peace be with you all and may the Lord forgive the Empress Evdosia. That's what they heard him say. After this, the relic was returned to its normal position and was buried with great reverence in that church. The Orthodox Church celebrates this translation, the translation of the Holy Relics of St. John Chrysostom, and the miracles that accompany it on January 27th. He is also celebrated on January 30th, the day of the three holy hierarchs, together with his two with two other great saints, St. Basil the Great and St. Gregory the Theologian. Through the prayers of St. John Chrysostom, may we become worthy of his eternal happiness, of the eternal happiness of paradise. Amen. Holy Father John, intercede for us. Amen. And this is a beautiful icon that we have of St. John Chrysostom right here in our kids club area. Okay, so thanks for joining us today. And you know what? If you ever get to visit us at St. Andrew in Riverside, we have a very special place in our temple. It's our little chapel dedicated to St. John Chrysostom. And on the walls, there's beautiful frescoes that show the whole life of St. John Chrysostom and all that we've talked about today in this book and more. Many saints are depicted in the, in the chapel that are special to St. John or were friends of his. And you, you can see all of them on, on the walls in our St. John Chrysostom Chapel. Have a beautiful and blessed day and we'll see you next time on PNP Kids. This story is one of many from the Friends of Christ book series available from New Rome Press.